I'm Randy Schaup, uh, and I want to talk today about monoliths, micro migrations, and microservices. Um, a little bit about my background, uh, so to save Oliver some words, but also to give you some sense of like why I'm even saying these things and where my experiences have come from. So right now I'm VP of Engineering at WeWork. So who's heard of WeWork? Yeah, quite a few of you, that's awesome. Many of you have your offices in our spaces. Um, we also operate offices for big companies like Amazon, like Facebook, like Microsoft, uh, and 30% of the uh, Fortune 500. So we're basically the cloud, but for physical space. Uh, I used to be VP of engineering at Stitch Fix for two years. So Stitch Fix is a clothing retailer in the United States and soon to be in the UK. Uh, and Stitch Fix uses a ton of technology and uh, data science to decide what clothes people might like and then send them those clothes. Earlier, I spent a bunch of time at Google working on Google App Engine, so that's Google's platform as a service. Um, and then I spent six and a half years earlier in my career at eBay working as the chief engineer uh, on uh, eBay search engine infrastructure. So cool. Um, so the genesis for this talk uh, was when I was doing some consulting in between uh, a few of these roles. And um, I got these questions from small startups, you know, mostly in the Bay Area. So they would say, hey, Randy, you know, you worked at, at Google and eBay. Tell us how you did stuff. And my answer was, sure, I'll be very happy to tell you, but you have to promise not to do it. The idea there is not that Google and eBay do terrible things, it's that the stuff that works at Google scale, which has literally 30,000 engineers, that's not 30,000 people in the company, that's 30,000 engineers at Google, the stuff that works at Google scale is entirely and completely inappropriate for if you're three or 30 or something like that. Cool. Um, so I want to tell a few stories about how big companies started out actually small. So eBay, where I worked for a long time, depending on how you count, has, is on its fifth complete rewrite of its infrastructure. So it started famously in 1995 as a three-day weekend project by the founder. So Piero Midyar, the uh, original co uh, founder of eBay, um, was playing around with this new cool thing called the web. Uh, and he was playing around, you know, in his little, in his home, um, and he put up this web page, which ultimately, you know, ended up becoming eBay. So that was written in Perl. Every item was a file. It was, it didn't scale, and it wasn't intended to. It wasn't even really intended to be a proof of concept for a business. It was just some nerd, just like us, screwing around, trying to see if he could do build something interesting with the web. Uh, the next iteration was uh, a monolithic C++ implementation, which at its worst grew to 3.4 million lines of code in a single DLL. Yeah. So if you guys think you have a monolith, like, we can talk. Um, that was pretty bad. They were actually hitting the compiler limits on the number of methods per class, which I'm ashamed to say I know. It's 16K. 16K. So as terrible as your monolith is with everybody maybe in the same code base, these guys were in the same file and actually even in the same class. So don't do that. The next iteration was, a, right, the next iteration, but eBay survived. But eBay survived, that's the other part, uh, part of the lesson. Uh, the next iteration was an implementation in Java. You couldn't really call it microservices, but more mini applications. So each part of the site had a backing application. So, you know, application for the search pages, application for the selling pages, application for the buying pages, et cetera. And now it's fair to characterize eBay as a polyglot set of microservices. Twitter's gone through a similar evolution. It started famously as the world's largest Ruby on Rails application, which of course they codenamed the monorail. Excellent, very clever. Um, the next iteration was pulling out a bunch of the front end, mostly into JavaScript, a bunch of the back end um, out, actually into services mostly written in Scala, because Twitter, as I'm sure many of us know, is a very, very early adopter of Scala. Um, and then now it's fair to characterize Twitter as a polyglot set of microservices. Amazon has gone through a similar evolution. So uh, up until the year 2000 or so, Amazon was a monolith. It was C++ on the back end, this Perl Mason hybrid for the front end. Um, and then a, thing, a, a story that I think has not been told as widely as it should, um, between Jeff Bezos and Werner Fogels, they spent the, the years 2000 to 2005 completely re-implementing all of Amazon in, a, in what they then called a service-oriented architecture. And in retrospect, we would probably call it microservices. But the point is that they rebuilt everything in services, um, chopped up their monolithic database into smaller databases, chopped up their monolithic application into smaller ones. And then what happened in 2006? AWS started, and then the um, successive juggernaut of Amazon taking over the entire world's retail and the entire world's software uh, began at that time too. Um, so in case anybody thinks that architecture doesn't matter, this is the story. Does it make sense? 
Amazon could not have done what they have been able to do in the last, whatever, 12 years if they hadn't spent those five doing that other stuff. Great, and now you can call Amazon microservices. Does there look like there's a pattern here? Yeah, <laughs> knowing laughter. Yeah, there are actually two parts to the pattern though, which is no one starts with microservices, but everybody beyond a certain scale, and like triple underline that, beyond a certain scale, everybody ends up co-evolving to something that we would now call microservices. One of the things we're gonna know throughout this talk, and I'm gonna talk a lot about microservices and how to migrate to them, but I really want you to remember that maybe 90% of the applications on the planet are, partic are, are perfectly well served by a monolithic approach. Does it make sense? Cool, all right. We'll talk about the 10% in this, uh, in this uh, thing. Uh, here's the way I, I like to say it. If you don't end up regretting the early technology decisions that you made, you probably over-engineered. There absolutely may have been an eBay and Amazon competitor in 1995 that instead of building a business, built a distributed system, but there's a reason why we've never heard of that company. Right? Cool, okay. So here's the progression of, in my mind, most companies and most products. And we're gonna go through each of these steps and talk about what's the appropriate uh, sort of architecture to deal with each of these uh, stages. So the initial, uh, the initial stage we'll talk about, which I'll, I'll call the idea phase, like what is it are we even building? Is there a business model here? Is there value to this product, to this service, to this business? Then we're gonna talk about what I call the starting phase. So that's that beginning part of the S-curve where we're slowly, you know, we have maybe a handful of, of customers or clients and we're slowly you know, improving our service or our capabilities to serve them. Then we'll talk about the scaling phase and only at that phase to telegraph stuff is where we're gonna do fancier distributed system stuff. And then most companies and most products end up in a kind of optimizing phase as well. Okay, so let's start with the idea phase. Um, and, the, and if you take nothing else away from this talk, I'd like you to take away these seven words because they are incredibly powerful as engineers. The particular application of these seven words here is when I am in the idea phase of my product, my service, my application, my company, I should constantly be asking myself, what problem are we solving, right? Not what solution do we have and can we find some problems, um, it's what problem are we addressing you know, in the market with our coworkers, uh, whatever, and, what, and, um, and then does it make sense for us to solve it with the software that we're hoping to build? So when we're in this idea phase, we really shouldn't be having much fancy architecture at all because really what we're doing is prototyping. So our goal here is to explore the solution space as rapidly and cheaply as possible. We want to find if there's a business model for a company. We want to find if there's product market fit, and we want to acquire our first customers. Does this make sense? And I hope it's clear that this is true, I keep saying it, but it's true not just for companies or startups, but also for products and services within an enterprise, right? When we're first building something, it might possibly, we might not know, uh, you know if, um, if anybody's going to use it. Um, and so here what we're trying to do is we're trying to rapidly iterate. So basically everything we're building here is a prototype, whether we like it or not. And whether we like it or not, we're very, very likely to throw it away. So given that that's true, let's take advantage of that fact. So ideally at this phase, we might not build any technology at all. So who's worked with UX designers that have done paper prototypes? Yeah, a lot of people in the room. That is a wonderful, very low tech, very uh, low fidelity, but also very low investment way of exploring an idea, right? And the people that are really good at that are great at refining away maybe you know, 80% of the things before anybody even touches a computer. Does it make sense? And literally, when you're done with a paper, you can throw it away. Like, you can literally crump it up in a ball and you know, put it in the recycling. Uh, the other thing in which famously, you know, uh, Eric Ries in the Lean Startup book uh, popularized is this interesting idea of if I'm not sure if there's a business, if there, I'm not sure there's a business behind, I don't know, hand-delivered puppy food or something like that, I could put up a Google ad for hand-delivered puppy food and see if anybody clicks on it. Like that's a good way of uh, seeing if there's actually a market there before I've uh, spent any money, hired any people, or built any software. Um, lots, of, lots of businesses, including several that I've worked for, started out life as an Excel spreadsheet. Like that's what Stitch Fix started at. Now it's like super fancy 80 data scientists, you know, PhD level astrophysicists and uh, experimental psychologists working at, working at it. But the initial iteration was an Excel spreadsheet maintained by the founder. Uh, a WordPress blog is, lot, is also a great way to start things up. Does it, seem, does it make sense what I'm talking about? Do something that's very cheap, very simple, and very low tech. And if you really, really need to build something, 
I think you don't. But if you really, really, really need to build something, use very familiar technology and just cobble it together. Again, because this is not the thing that's going to get you to scale. This is the thing to simply test if there's value in building software at all. Cool. Uh, Paul Graham of Y Combinator likes to speak about this phase at, uh, and he says, do things that don't scale. Right? This is the time where don't think about scale, just think about is there actually a business, is there actually a product market fit for the thing I want to build. Cool. Okay, so we have an idea. Now we're going to start things up. So um, at the starting phase, we're typically one team, right? People have worked at startups or small teams where everybody fits around a conference table. Like this is the feeling of that, of that time. Uh, and then typically, don't take the numbers super seriously, but typically we don't have a very long time horizon of whether we're going to exist in the future or how far ahead we can see in terms of the feature set that we're building. Does it make sense what I'm suggesting? Like, particularly if we're a startup, we might only have a couple of months of runway. Um, and even if, we're, even if we have plenty of uh, money and plenty of people, we still at this phase probably can't see very far ahead in terms of the features that we want to build, in terms of the overall stuff that we're, uh, roadmap that we're trying to build. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So, and the implication of that is, again, let's optimize and take advantage of the fact that we don't need to or, and are not able to see very far. Okay, so now we're, gonna, now we're gonna have a very small team. Who's heard of this two pizza team idea? Yeah, lots of people, great. Again, credited to Jeff Bezos of Amazon, and he says a team can be no larger than can be fed by two large pizzas. Uh, when I gave a similar talk in Cuba, I had to explain to them what we meant by a large pizza, not because they've never seen pizza before, but because they do the Italian-style stuff where there's no concept, like, everybody's individual pizzas. So I had to explain, you know, the size of an American pizza, and they were like, that's weird. But yeah, it was all cool. Um, cool, great. Uh, so in this starting phase, we really want to build just enough architecture to get us going. So again, our goal is to meet near-term customer needs as cheaply and as quickly as possible. We want to delight those first customers that we found, and we want to acquire more. Again, what we're trying to do is rapidly learn and improve. With our tiny team, we want to optimize for team productivity. And this is very, very much not about scaling not about scaling at all. Um, I think, well, not now, but some other time over beers or whiskeys or teas or something like that, I'm very happy to tell my personal startup story where I came out of eBay doing all this big scale stuff and I couldn't get it in my head that this is what I was supposed to do. So among the many reasons why my startup failed was my not knowing this lesson. Cool, okay. Uh, Martin Fowler, so our wonderful, you know, uh, uh, sarcastic and brilliant uh, writer of refactoring and uh, you know patron of our industry um, the best code you can write now is code that you're gonna throw away Does that make sense cool all right so what would the architecture look at this level so we want to use simple familiar technology this is not the time to explore you know new stuff that you don't really know um, so ease of use expressive power uh, and this is why you know rapid prototyping frameworks like you know Ruby and Rails and the various PHP frameworks tend to be really popular for um, startups in this phase not because they're better or worse technologies in life it's just that they really are optimized for or are best for you know this phase where we're rapidly throw, uh, rapidly putting things together and um, and maybe throwing things away we absolutely, at this point, want a monolithic architecture, right? We want a single application. We want a single database, because there's no need for anything more in terms of scale. Uh, and then we very much want minimal infrastructure. So we ideally use something that's you know, serverless, and that could be, I don't, I mean the broader idea of serverless, not just functions as a service, but like this is the opportunity for us to use maybe a platform as a service, like an app engine or a Heroku or something like that, uh, Lambda. But this is not the time that you're building your own infrastructure, typically. Does it make sense? Cool. All right. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So, you know, the classic three tier. There's some presentation tier, which is, you know, maybe in a mobile device or a JavaScript in a browser. There's some application written in one of these rabbit prototyping frameworks. And then it's over a really simple, straightforward database. So as with all engineering choices, there are trade-offs, of course. There are things that are good about this and things that are bad. So what are some good things? It's very simple, particularly at first. All the latencies that we have within parts of our, of our uh, software are all in process, so it's really fast. We have a single a build unit, a single deployment unit, and it's very resource efficient at small scale, right? This might fit on one uh, machine or, or, uh, or a couple of small machines. Great, but there are of course some cons. As our team size grows, we're gonna get a lot of coordination, or coordination overhead in that monolith, even if you don't 
hit compiler limits on the number of methods per class, you're still gonna run into some coordination overhead. Uh, there's poor enforcement of modularity, and I'm choosing my words here very carefully. It's very possible to build a modular monolith. That's, by the way, I mean, look, I'm pretty old, um, and uh, when we first built software, we weren't like building distributed systems. We built monster things out of small individual components. So it's totally possible and totally doable, but in a monolith, there is no enforcement of that. Does it make sense? The enforcement, such as it is, is your own programming and team discipline and your own development process. This is not a place where we get horizontal scaling typically, and then that monolith is both a single point of failure and typically a single performance bottleneck. But guess what? At this phase, we don't have any of these problems. Right? All those things are incredibly true about monoliths, but for the most part, for those 90% of applications that never kind of exit that starting phase, that initial phase, none of these things are really, are really important and are, are really true, and therefore we don't, we don't have to solve for them. Okay? We're gonna solve for them in a sec, though. Okay, uh, but as we get, uh, and as we slowly think that we're about to scale, there are some several things that we can do in the monolithic world that can make our lives easier. And one thing that I was trying to underline a moment ago is this idea of putting componentization or modularity uh, within the monolith, right? So, you know, choose your own wording in your own particular framework, but use the concept of shared libraries, jars, gems, et cetera, within that monolith. Um, which uh, is nice from a, you know, an isolation perspective if you end up having separate teams, but also as you grow, if you want, end up you know, wanting to replace those things with external services, it makes it a lot easier to modify and replace them. I think no matter what your scale, you really wanna have detailed logging, certainly because you wanna understand what users are doing with your software, and also probably because you wanna be able to diagnose and recover from issues that go wrong in production. And then I think a thing that is always a good idea is the ability to move quickly, right? So even in a monolithic world, this is very possible. Um, and you wanna get to the point where whether you do or you don't, you at least have the capability to deploy your software many times a day. Like that's the ideal situation. Um, I refer you to the uh, recently um, released book called Accelerate, which talks about all the science behind why continuous delivery and various other DevOps practices uh, give you better software, happier people, and also more money. Um, and the DevOps Handbook is also a great resource for learning all about this stuff. Cool. So when are we gonna re-architect? So when does this monolith kind of run out of gas? So I've seen several in my kind of life and consulting practices. Um, the first typically is around velocity. So this was the term that we used at eBay, where our ability to deliver software has slowed down over time. Has anybody experienced that? Like when we were small, we were super fast, and now we're big, we're slower. That seems counterintuitive. Um, we can talk about why uh, that's true, but that is absolutely a good indicator that maybe we need to break this monolith up into smaller pieces. Um, another, you know, teams stepping on each other's toes. The other the very similar uh, warning indicator is if it takes a long time for new engineers that join your team to be productive, right? If it takes several months before they can actually commit code to source control that actually works, that's a good indicator that things are a little bit too complex and too interrelated. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, cool. Uh, scaling is another totally independent um, uh, reason why we might want to re-architect and break up the monolith. It, this, so the characteristics of this is that vertical scaling of the monolith is running out of gas, um, and parts of the system, or, and similarly, relatedly, parts of the system might, to, might need to evolve or scale independent of each other. Right? So at the, in the eBay example, you know, the growth of users might not be at the same dimension, might not be at the same rate as the growth of items on the site, which was absolutely true. Right? So splitting out users into their own services and databases separate from items was a really useful thing that we did at, uh, did at eBay. Does it make sense? It's independent scaling uh, for different parts of the system. And then the third reason, which is hardly anybody's first reason, but it's almost everybody's secondary reason, and it, uh, is the idea of independently deploying parts of the system. Because I'm sure, as you can imagine, like no matter how simple a system, um, different parts of it tend to evolve at different rates. So it tends to be true that the user experience part of it, like whether it's JavaScript or whatever, tends to iterate and change pretty quickly. But typically, once you've built, say, an authentication system, that doesn't tend to evolve very, uh, very much at all. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of weird if you think about it when you're in this phase, like why am I, every time I deploy my JavaScript, why am I deploying my authentication system along with it? Does that make sense? Cool, okay, great. So now we have entered this scaling phase and we're gonna figure out what to do. 
Uh, so again, characteristics sort of organizationally of this scaling phase are that we typically don't have one team anymore. We typically have more and more teams, and as we scale, we're gonna get more and more. Um, and also, we tend to have a longer time horizon, right? So again, don't take too seriously the particular numbers, but we for sure have a longer life, expected life expectancy, if you see what I mean. Like, we're likely to, to survive a lot longer uh, than when we were before, and also we should have larger, longer um, visibility into the future of our features and our business. So let's talk about what the architecture might look like, and then we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about how we get from that monolith state to, to this uh, scalable, maybe microservice state. Uh, so our goal here, let's, let's say that, what problem are we solving? We want to stay ahead of this rapidly growing business, right? Our users are growing, their usage of our system, I hope, is growing. And we basically, I mean, if we're like an, uh, an eBay or a, uh, a Google or an Amazon or a, or a Twitter, we're like simply trying to keep the site up, right? People remember the fail whale on Twitter, right? Like this is, this was, that was their struggling during this period. Do you notice that we hardly ever see the fail whale on Twitter now? Yeah, because they've gotten past it. Cool. So here we are scaling the team. So we're scaling the organization. Uh, we are typically also scaling the technology. I'm going to talk in detail about what I mean by that. Um, and then we're also trying to typically needing to introduce a bunch of repeatable processes at this point so that we can um, uh, produce software um, more reliably or more repeatably. That's a better way to say that. Cool. So by contrast to that first thing where I showed the single two pizza team, in an ideal world at this, at this scale, in my experience, you typically have many two pizza teams, each of which is responsible for some particular area of the business or particular application or set of services. I'm calling those here domains for, you know, by, uh, to pay homage a little bit to the domain-driven design idea. Um, but does it make sense, like small individual teams that are each responsible for you know, a particular area of your overall system, and you know, the er the, um, those circles are intended to show that we keep those teams small so that they can iterate really rapidly and have a, and have a tight feedback loop. Cool, so this is the organizational context, the, uh, and now let's talk about the software reflection of that organizational context. So typically this is the time where we're gonna move to technology that scales. So this is a place commonly, not always, but commonly um, companies will migrate from those early prototyping frameworks into things that you know, are more, I guess we'll say enterprisey or more longer lasting. So that can be Python, that can be Go, that can be the JVM languages including Scala. You know, you can imagine that there are obviously, uh, you know, different languages and frameworks that work better at different, uh, you know, different uh, phases, if you like. Uh, we're now, we're now, and really only now, are we thinking about concurrency and asynchrony as first order concerns in our infrastructure. We're typically now starting to split out systems out of that monolith into more independent systems. Um, sometimes these things are fit for purpose. Like one of the really common things is man, we have this monster, you know, MySQL database, but we're also running all of our batch jobs on that thing. Has anybody had that experience? You can replace MySQL with Oracle or whatever. Yeah, but you know what I'm talking about. That's a super common situation that we tend to undo by, instead of running all those analytic queries against the primary transactional database, maybe we have a read-only replica, or maybe we use a fit-for-purpose analytic system uh, like a data warehouse or something like that. Uh, search is another example where often people, you know, up until this point can get away with doing full text search in their primary database, and then you learn over time that, you know, that doesn't scale very well with increased load, and so you typically introduce a separate special search engine. Uh, typically, we're starting to separate out special services in the back end. So payments and billing, I've often seen, uh, they because people, I don't know, care about money, I guess. Um, they, those tend to be things that people uh, pull out pretty uh, pretty quickly. And then also, here's the, here's an opportunity, or here's the place where we start to introduce more layered services like caching and stuff. Does that make conceptual sense? Cool. Uh, and then often, this is, the, this is the case if we haven't already, we want to introduce some kind of message bus, event queue, you know, some kind of way of asynchronously communicating between, between different components in the system. Um, great, okay. Uh, and then the last thing is, typically now we're gonna see, we have to ask ourselves the question, is that primary storage mechanism the right, is that single primary storage mechanism the right thing to do? And often we need to think about how are we gonna break up that monolithic database uh, we might partition into different functional areas, you know, different domains, if you like, users or items or transactions or something like that. Uh, and we might try to think about sharding at this point. Okay, 
Well, so the, the mirror to the organization where we build our large system out of a large organization out of small independent teams is that we should build our maybe our large software system out of small independent components. The modern word for that is microservices. We've been doing that much longer, by the way, than the word microservices, but uh, that's, the, that's the word we're using now. So if I have to define microservice, I'm going to say it's a single purpose. It's got a simple, well-defined interface, and it's modular and independent. And one thing that we have learned since the 90s when we first started doing service-oriented architecture is one of the key things to make a microservices approach successful is that we have what I'll call isolated persistence, is that each individual service owns its own database, or at least logically, um, for reasons we're we can talk about. But well, I will talk about it now. Very briefly, if it is possible for somebody to read and write your data behind your back, you are incapable of um, guaranteeing any invariance in your service. Does it make sense? Like, my code might not even be executed. Like, I can't do much interesting when that's true. So one of the things that we learned, again, since the 90s, for the most part, is this is the way that services need to own their own, uh, own, their own persistence. OK, cool. Well, just like in monolithic world, microservices have their pros and cons as well. So each microservice is a simple and a small unit. That's one of the reasons why we're trying to do this. They can be independently scaled, and we can apply independent performance techniques to them. That's really useful. Uh, we can independently test them and independently deploy them. That has nice properties. And also, we can choose the optimal technology stack. So rather than being in process you know, with maybe one language or one framework, now we at least have the option. We don't, it's not required at all, but we have at least the option to build systems in different languages or different frameworks if those, are, those would be better and a better fit for the purpose. And then a thing that I think is less uh, widely appreciated than it should be is those services also tend to be security boundaries. And so if I put, if anybody's in a regulated environment, as I'm sure many of us are, uh, at least if you're a public company, you're for sure in a regulated environment, um, you know, putting a boundary around the payments and billing and revenue com uh, com um, uh, computation, that's something that um, helps you a lot. Cool. But there are cons to this, like microservices are not the solution to every uh, everything in the world. There may be many, there may be, um, the units might be simple, but, the, but there are many cooperating units. Um, we've exchanged those in-process latencies for um, out-of-process or network latencies, so we need to be a little bit more careful being, uh, not being too chatty between our components. Now that we have a distributed system, we need to be clearer about more sophisticated deployment and monitoring. And then also, this is arguable, but from the boxes and lines architecture perspective, it does look more complicated, right? There are more boxes and there are more lines. If there's a net, whether there's a net increase in complexity or not, we can absolutely have that conversation that's actually debatable, to be honest. But anyway, great. OK, does this make sense, pros and cons? All right, cool. Now let's figure out how to get there. So first thing I want to start is talking about how to do an incremental migration instead of one big bang. Then I want to talk about the two separate techniques, slightly separate, around migrating a monolithic application versus a monolithic database. And then we'll, um, and then we'll close, essentially. Um, so uh, let's look at incremental migration. So I'm gonna, again, I'm going to quote Martin Fowler because I like him so much, and he's so clever. I love this. The only thing a big bang migration guarantees is a big bang. So yeah, uh, so let's not do that. Instead, let's migrate incrementally. So here's the way that I've found, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, but stick with me. Um, when I am doing a new architecture, like whether that's monolith to microservices or really any, any major change, I do want to make sure that I um, understand the risks and I try to learn things as much as possible. Because for, in most of those situations, none of, none of the people on my team or very few people on my team have actually ever done this new thing. So I want to do a pilot. And I'm intentionally not saying prototype, I'm saying a pilot. So I want to choose some end-to-end -end vertical experience. Maybe it's something that already exists, or maybe it's a new thing that I want to build. But I choose that, and I build that in a new way. And why do I do that? It's because it gives me an opportunity to learn how to do things in the new way with my people, with my technology, with, you know, in my organization, and also to adjust over time. Because there are mistakes we're going to make and things we're going to learn, and we'd rather learn that in one area than if we're trying to do it all at once at the same time. Uh, we actually are also going to gain confidence as an organization, so we're going to demonstrate that it's actually feasible, again, with our people, with our technology, and so on, and gain confidence that we can move forward. Um, but also, we're going to bound the investment and risk in case it doesn't go as, help, uh, as much as we hoped. Um, and at, but at the minimum, we have at least provided customer value. Does it make sense? At the end of this, we have at least provided 
a better thing that, than that already existed or often a new thing. And the, the other aspect of this pilot is that it allows us to stay focused. Right? We build stuff for the pilot. We, we don't need to build stuff that we don't need for the pilot, um, uh, which allows us to stay focused and not like spend two years or five years like building foundations before we ever you know, do something that's valuable to the user. And this initial step is very much the hardest, right? Because you do have to build or buy or steal the underlying foundations that allow you to do the new architecture. Um, but, you know, but I think, it's, I think you really need this step before you move forward. So here's the other counterintuitive an, uh, uh, angle of this, and I learned this at eBay. Um, so the way that eBay did its, its um, uh, migration between that C++ monolith into the Java mini applications um, was by, once they'd done this pilot and felt comfortable that yes, we could do Java and we could do mini applications, they basically reverse sorted all of the pages on the site by revenue. So like the highest revenue pages first, the lowest revenue pages last. And they actually started with the highest revenue ones first. Now that would seem frighteningly risky if we had not done that pilot earlier. Does it make sense? That's why we did the pilot, to de-risk it so we could do this. The reason why we do it in this way is we focus on the things that are gonna provide the most return on investment. Yeah, the things that people are actually are using, the things that are actually changing, uh, those are the places where this new architecture is gonna be best and pay off most quickly in the near term. And if you run out of patience, money, executive sponsorship, whatever, at least you have done the important stuff as opposed to keeping it to last, right? Because the supposedly risk, uh, risk minimizing way of approaching this is do all the easy stuff and defer the hard stuff till you're years into it, which is super risky because what if the hard stuff doesn't even work, right? Cool, all right, uh, great. And so a thing you should just know is that you're never gonna get the business and the product organization to stop asking you for new features. You should not even want them to do that, by the way, because you still wanna you know, help, your, help your existing customers. So you need to get comfortable with the idea that in certain parts of, the, of this uh, migration, you might be building the same feature in the old way and the new way. That's just life. Cool, okay. Uh, and when you are done with this, that residual monolith might still live around. At eBay, this was true, actually. There, several years after we were supposedly completed with that migration to the Java, there were still a, a few pages that were, you know, a handful of pages that were on the old thing, but like nobody really, you know, they weren't used very heavily, they were very simple, there weren't any downsides, so we just kind of left them. Cool, all right, now let's talk about migrating a monolithic application. So um, here is our monolith, it's this big, you know, rounded box. And I'm gonna borrow a phrase uh, from Michael Feather's excellent book, which is called uh, Dealing Effectively with Legacy Code, something like that. It's definitely got the effectively with legacy code part. I always forget the first word. But it was the only book that was required reading for people that joined Google. So Michael Feather's Dealing Effectively with Legacy Code, please read it, it's amazing. He uses this, uh, this word where he calls, when you're gonna cut something out of a monolith, you find a seam, like a seam in, in clothing, for example. And often, finding that seam or creating it through refactoring is the hardest first step. But once you have found that seam of like, I don't know, the payment system or the user authenticator or something like that, now you wall it off behind an interface within your programming environment, right? So that's like, make it its own separate jar, make it its own separate you know, uh, interface in your, in your uh, favorite environment. And now, please don't skip this step, write automated tests around the interface. Please don't skip this step. If you do, you will regret it. Why? Because the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna replace its implementation. So if I replace the implementation and I have not written tests around, uh, around the component itself, how am I gonna know whether uh, my new implementation works? Right? Uh, cool, okay, and then just rinse and repeat. So now pull in, find another seam, pull another piece out, find another seam, pull another piece out. Does it make sense? It seems, Honestly, every time I talk about this to people, uh, whether they're on my team or you, know, you guys, it seems like unsatisfyingly simple, um, but uh, I can't, I've never seen uh, you know, breaking up a big application that didn't kind of go through these steps, mostly in this order. Cool, all right. Um, so now I wanna talk about the slightly different techniques you might use if you have a bunch of applications that are using one centralized shared database. Is that a common thing for people in the room? Yeah, it definitely has been for me. So this is what we did at Stitch Fix, so I'll talk about that experience. 
So our problem was that we had one monster monolithic database, but we actually had tens of different applications and services that all stored their data in the same place. Um, and basically, like every interesting entity in the system, you know, lived in this shared database. So uh, what we want to do, obviously, conceptually, is we want to decouple applications and services from that shared database. So the first, um, oh, and let's, uh, just to make the boxes and lines simpler, I'm going to pretend that we have three tables and two applications when we actually had 175 tables and 80 applications, but whatever. Okay, so let's start with this. Let's imagine we have two applications, each of which are using three tables. Okay, so step one is we're going to create a service around, you know, one particular entity, which typically might be backed by one of those tables. Uh, the next step, which is the hardest, is now we want to make sure that all the applications are using that service. So I'm gonna go back. This moving of boxes and of like lines on that thing, this is like multiple engineer months of work potentially, but like make sure that you've cut all the uses of that table. Um, those applications are not using the tables directly, but only going through the client service. And you might need several iterations of that service interface to make sure you get it all. You actually might need a couple different services, to be honest. Um, but you need to get to the point where nobody is using that table except for that particular service. And then and only then are you able to move that out into its own database and move forward. If you do not do finish this step, if you leave it in this state, you are worse. You are worse now than when you started. Why? Because you have all the problems of a monolithic database and you have all the problems of a distributed system. That sucks. And when I arrived at Stitch Fix, no fault to anybody, we'd done a ton of like, oh, we've created a whole bunch of services. Are they out of the shared database? Oh, no, we haven't gotten them out of the shared database yet. Like, yeah, it's worse. Um, does it make sense? Yeah, so you really need to finish. Like, if you're going to start it, you really need to finish it. It's one of those rare things in software where you, make, you can make little improvements and then you actually make it worse, but only by going through that valley of worseness can you get up to the you know, next mountain of wonderfulness. Uh, cool, and then you, again, you know, it's very easy to do, this, to do this with boxes and lines, but then you do the same thing for, in this example, items, in this example, SKUs, which are our metadata about the things that we sold. Um, and then I want to just underline this idea that the service boundary actually surrounds not just the application part, but also the persistence part. Does it make sense? Cool, excellent. All right, um, lots of people think that, would ask, hey Randy, if I know that I'm gonna re-architect five years from now, um, you know, why don't I just start with microservices in the first place? And my answer is typically, when you re-architect, it's not that you have to re-architect, it's more that you get to re-architect. What do I mean by that? I mean that the reason why you're re-architecting is because, I don't know, your business is doing well and your product is being used. That's kind of good. Um, but also, you have the time, I mean, you're always doing it under the gun, but like you at least have the resources to attempt it, right? You know that you're going to survive several years, or I hope, you know, in the future, so it's worth making this investment. You have the people, you have the resources. Like, it's always painful, don't get me wrong. Um, but it really is a sign of success more than a sign of failure. Does it make sense? Great. I want to leave, with, with, leave you with a few last thoughts, um, and then maybe we'll have a, a, a few minutes for questions. Uh, but I'll be around for the rest of the conference, too. Um, so uh, two things that I think are important about building, uh, building good microservices are these. The first is that you really need to think about a service. You really need to think about, ask yourself, what is the system of record for this data in our system? So in this example, let's imagine there's a customer service, and that's the service that is the canonical representation of the customer. And ideally, that's the only place where you write customers, where you update, uh, add and update customers. But of course, in any interesting service, or any interesting system, there are lots of different places that refer to customer overall. And what I want you to do, if you can, uh, is every other usage of customer is a read-only, non-authoritative cache. And I'm very intentionally using all those terms. Uh, it's read-only because I could maybe ask the billing service what's the customer's name, like maybe I could ask that, um, and maybe it would even tell me, um, but that's not the, that's not the um, that might be stale, right? That's not the uh, system of record for that, for that answer. Um, it's non-authoritative, again, so I might ask it, but it might, it might be stale. And then it's a cache, so it has all the different, all the wonderful properties of cache, of, uh, cache consistency and cache coherence. Does this make sense? 
Cool. So the other you know, architectural tool I want to give you, which is not going to be surprising at a reactive conference, is that you know, green message bus deal in the, in the center. So the way I like to think about it is uh, when I am communicating with different parts of a system, um, I do like those, I do prefer, want to prefer that those communications are over asynchronous events, and that as when we describe the interface of one of the services in, in our system, that we describe the events as a first class part of that interface. So if you ask somebody, you know, what's the interface to your service? Almost surely they will add if there's a synchronous request response part of the service, like for sure that's part of the interface, right? And usually people stop there. But, th but I think we should also say as part of a service interface what events the service produces, what events the service consumes, and we're not gonna talk about this now, but if there's any other like bulk read and writes, bulk updates from a external third party system, bulk uh, reads out into an analytic system, for example, those are also part of the interface of your service. And uh, I want to make sure that we, you know, have in our interface or that we express in our interface all the different mechanisms that get data into or out of it. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. So the last phase, which we're not going to spend too much time talking about, is this optimizing phase. This is nothing wrong. Again, like this is another indication of success. Um, typically now, though, as we optimize, we're going to want to see if we can, you know, keep a constant set of functionality, but maybe reduce the resources, whether uh, in terms of technology or in terms of people. So we might, over time, be, you know, shrinking the number of people that we put on this, and also and putting them on other products that are actually growing and scaling, right? Um, and then we probably, and the reason why we're in this optimizing phase is probably we have a much longer time horizon about uh, how long this is going to last. Does it, does it make sense? Cool. Okay. Uh, so what we did today was we talked about uh, the different architectures that we would look that we would use for the idea phase, for the starting phase, for the scaling phase, and for the optimizing phase. Uh, and I hope you've had a wonderful conference here at uh, Reactive Summit. Uh, and so thank you very much. <laughs>